Hello and welcome to Esther's Gardening Adventures. I'm Esther and I just saw the neatest thing. I was looking out my window to see if the watering I had done on my plants was helping them look a little bit better. And lo and behold, there was a hummingbird drinking from my salvia flowers. Now I got a little bit of a, of a shot of it, but it was through my windows, which I definitely need to clean. So <laughs> I'll show you a quick shot of it here. This is what the hummingbirds were drinking from. It's pretty little salvia flowers. And while I'm over here, let me show you my, this is um, candy stick or candy cane. I'll find the right name for it. Xenia that I grew this year. Uh, I have one in my community garden as well that looks really beautiful. And they're just so, they're kind of delicate looking actually. Like if you don't look close, you don't notice that they have this pattern. And then you see it and you're like, ooh. But it made me so happy to see because, you know, one of the things I want to do with my gardening is of course I want to provide food for myself and my family, but I also want to help the local ecosystem and to see a hummingbird um, visiting my plants and drinking from them. My husband has mentioned that he's seen them before, but I haven't seen them. Uh, and so, yeah, that was a really exciting moment for me. <laughs> so today I thought I would talk a little bit about the perennial and native and medicinal flowers that I'm growing. They're all kind of mixed together in my mind. I try to grow things that are perennial, um, you know, in my, in my front yard garden, as well as some vegetables and other things. But for example, this echinacea or this cone flower here, I really love how they've kind of all clustered and leaned on this fence uh, as sort of a support for them naturally. And then they're leaning on my tomato plant over here uh, for support as well. Oh, it's gorgeous. Uh, I don't know if you, you can see there's bees visiting it, there's butterflies visiting it. Um, and I'm going to use this for medicinal value too. Now you don't, I just looked it up and echinacea, you use the roots from the echinacea, but you don't actually harvest it until it's at least in its second year. Well, this is its second year and it's flowering, but I'm going to give it one more year before I harvest the roots from it. Cause I want to make sure this thing is well established before I start tearing out parts of it. Um, but I could definitely tear, uh, harvest some of it to this year. And maybe when I, you know, prune it back a little bit, maybe uh, I'll harvest some of the roots. Now you harvest them in the fall when the plant's sort of done. So I don't have to make the decision quite yet, thankfully. Uh, also in the yard we have, and I'll get a little closer shot, but we have the black eyed Susans, which are actually, they're, they're native to Maryland Zone 7A to this state uh, and to quite a bit in our area on the East Coast. As I mentioned in my last video, these, both of these flowers, both the Black Eyed Susan flowers and the Echinacea were things that I grew using winter sowing. All right, now let me show you a couple more things that are perennial that uh, I really love. Uh, and I'm gonna check in on a few ones that I haven't really talked about much before. The next plant I want to talk about are sea oats, Indian sea oats they're called. They are kind of a grass-like plant. Uh, they're native to Maryland and much of this area. And they produce these beautiful, I don't know how well you can see it. Let's get the camera a little closer. They produce these beautiful oat looking type seed structures that if you cut it and put it into a vase, gives this really beautiful sort of dangly, hangy sort of vibe. But one of the things I love about it is just there's such a pretty thing. Now if, now a, a word to the warn, a word of warning. So this area of my garden is part shade, which will in some ways inhibit the growth of these sea oats from getting even more crazy than they could be. But also underneath here, the last owners had some really thick uh, garden cloth that just is really hard to cut through. And so I'm counting on it to help keep the sea oats from taking over the entire bed because they can be very hard to control and maintain. But I figure that having it sort of not in full sun conditions and also in an area where breaking through that weed cloth will be very difficult, it should help it. But let's just see how beautiful it is blowing in the breeze. Now this next flower I'm going to show you, I can't recall whether they're perennial 
or annual. I believe they're perennial. And they are mist flower. Now these are supposed to be replacement for um, the flower that I cannot pronounce. It's spelled A-G-E-R-A-T-U-M. Ageratum, ageratum, I butcher it and don't kill me for it, but they produce these beautiful little sets of purple flowers. And I have them throughout my garden. I have them in this bed. Uh, and the thing I like about these is the other ones are really short, but I like how these are sort of taller and fuller. And so they can kind of take up more space in a bed where you have something else that's tall. And when I say taller, I mean like, you know, two feet versus one foot. So here's a great example of mist flower in my garden. This is over in my native bed, which is sort of a work in progress. The leaves kind of look like a mint leaf, don't they? But it's quite a hardy plant. This grew up, it's, it's holding its own. It doesn't need any trellising or staking. It held up pretty well to drought. I think it's just a really lovely flower to have. I've got a Drummond's Aster growing here. I've got some native columbine growing that won't flower till next year but the purple columbine that wasn't native in this garden was gorgeous this year so i'm really looking forward to it. and that's where the non-native columbine is and you can see someone mentioned this and it's really true the columbine does keep its foliage year round uh it's you know all summer after it comes out in the spring so you may not have the flowers all year but you will have the nice foliage to help fill in uh, for a shade bed back here we have my work in progress fern bed. These are, I believe, the Christmas ferns that I got. So we have out of the 10 that I bought in the winter and kept inside and brought out and planted up, we have this one, it's doing pretty well. Now I do have to water them a little more often to make sure they stay moist. Uh, and then we have this gorgeous one here. We have another one over here that I didn't know had actually survived. And I was really excited when I saw it. Oh, I didn't even realize that was alive. Let's see if the camera's getting it. Yeah, sure enough. There's one over there too that's doing well. Uh, so looks like we have actually one, two, four, possibly five that have survived. And that one wasn't showing any signs of life. Uh, until maybe a week ago. So I'm gonna give it some water before the end of the day to help encourage it to keep going. You know, and that's the thing about gardening. Uh, I once watched a video where someone said, you can do it fast and really expensive, or you can go the slow and less expensive, but it will get done route. And that's kind of the approach I'm trying to take. You know, I winter sow what I can. If it's the kind of thing you can't winter sow, like ferns as easily, I'll buy some of them as starts or small instead of full size native ferns, um, you know, and give them time to grow. The other thing I will say is that as a uh, growing perennial and native plants, requires a little more patience. You know, often as a gardener, we want that instant reward. We want to come out and have that full garden looking like it's been there forever and well established. And the reality is native plants need a year or two to really establish and get going. There are some that are the exception, like the mist flower that seems really well. Another one that is the exception for kind of bushing out in the first year is anise hyssop. Let me go show you that. Here is my flower bed for native uh, shade one of my shade beds in the back and we've put some of the bricks around it We've got to do more and we've got to actually dig a spot for them to stay upright in it, but this will give you an idea so this is the anise hyssop and Look there's bees all around it. It's happy. It's doing well um, Yeah, that's a really happy plant and then we also have mist flower in front of it. Now the mist flower over here actually in front of the anise hyssop actually flowered already this year and it's kind of done flowering here. But in another part of the garden it hasn't flowered yet. The cardinal flower in my garden seems to be getting close to producing uh, actual flowers. This is my first year growing cardinal flower. Uh, so I have no idea what they'll look like. I know they're supposed to be red and they're supposed to be really pretty. Uh, and I'm just so thrilled that this plant is doing well. Um, the others along with it haven't produced quite as much. I believe this is a comfrey plant and uh, it's not doing as great as the one in my community garden where the leaves are huge, they're massive, but 
it is holding its own here in this backyard shade bed. And here's another one of my native backyard shade beds. We have the mist flower here. Uh, I have anise hyssop growing over there. Uh, we have the uh, we have the previously duct taped Solomon seal, and I've been meaning to do this so since I have you here. I might as well do it now. I've been meaning to take the duct tape off because now it's got some of its own leaves. Because I knew taking the duct tape off would mean breaking off the end of this thing. But I wanted to be able to make sure the plant had some leaves of its own. And this did serve as a, tempor a good temporary solution to make sure, you know, to make sure the plant did okay. So it has some leaves still. It'll be okay. It'll hopefully survive the winter. You may be wondering why I have these screens here. Well, I got a whole bunch of these screens and back behind them is some poison ivy that I need to dig up and deal with. And in the meantime, my dogs love going to the back fence. So I have that in front of it to stop them from going and touching the poison ivy and bringing it into the house. So, eh, it's not killing the plant, but at least it's preventing me from getting a giant rash from them. I'm going to end with a clip of me making a tomato sandwich. I hope you have a great day and see you next time. this girl she's nice and soft definitely got some questionable soft spots start off by taking that off mm, mm, mm. And there we go. Ah! Oh no! Not a chunk! Man down! Alright, so let's do our taste test. I haven't had this kind of tip. Ploppity plop, thank god my cutting board was underneath. Alright. Oh. So I like this tomato, but it's not as acidic as I like. I like more I like more acidic like with the Cherokee tomatoes. But it's beautiful and it tastes good. Oh, this is still such a pleasure to have in the morning, let me tell you.